What's going on, everybody? Welcome into episode 21 of To The Show We Go, featuring Ed Hand and myself, Andrew Parker. Uh, today's episode, we have our third media member in these 21 episodes. We had uh, Rob Bradford on for episode number five, and then we had Lou Merloni on for episode 10. And today, we're joined by Christopher Smith of Mass Alive. And now, Chris... I got, the Roger, that, I got the Roger Clemens episode. <laughs> that's actually a good point. Yes, I, I mean, I'm going to be the Roger Clemens of this podcast if you compare me to, you know, Lou Maloney and all these other guys. So here we go. Hey, you can follow up on Bradford and uh, Maloney. <laughs> but um, but I just wanted to, my first question is like, how has your offseason been treating you? Good. I mean, you know, it's kind of crazy because, you know, I, I have two kids and so I'm with them, you know, the oldest goes Monday, Wednesday, Friday to preschool. I've got a one-year-old that I stay with. So basically I'm Mr. You know, Mr. Mom, uh, you know, during the off season. But when my wife gets home from teaching during the day, then it's, you know, on to, you know, the real job of working and, you know, Red Sox stuff. And obviously this has been an interesting off season, you know, with, you know, just kind of trying to figure out who who they're going to pick and, you know, who's rejecting interviews, you know, for, you know, the chief baseball officer job and whatever like that. And, you know, getting to work with, uh, you know, Chris Cotillo and Sean McAdam. I mean, Chris Cotillo is, you know, crazy to work with just because, you know, he's always, you know, digging into stuff and he's always texting me like, you know, let's, you know, text this person, text this person, you know. And so, you know, it's always fun, but, you know, the off season's, you know, interesting for me just because, you know, I get so much time at home and, you know, I'm with the kids so much. So they drive me a little nuts. But then when the wife comes home, I get to do baseball. <laughs> you've, been, you've been doing baseball. Um, you've been making some pretty, uh, I don't want to say outrageous claims, but claims that I know are going to uh, get get Red Sox fans uh, pretty hyped up. Uh, you said something about Roman Anthony the other day, the number two prospect of the system, something that I – I believe you said you wouldn't be. It wouldn't be surprising if he was in the majors by the end of 2024. You do you recall that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I wrote it, and it's like, you know, I was just kind of putting together a list of you know ten guys that, you know, could could they make their major league debut in 2024, and you know, he's probably on the outside shot of the list. I mean, there's other more reasonable guys on the list, but you know, look at, I mean, it, you know. He, he he's that type of player. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's incredible. The, the ascent that he made in, I mean, like, you know, 14 months he was in, he was in high school that 14 months later he's in double a. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, absolutely. Ability, so I think that you're missing, you're misinterpreting what I'm saying. I don't disagree with you at all. I wouldn't be surprised if, oh, he, if, was, uh, if he made it either, but people don't, you know, you don't hear people generally predicting that about 19 year olds. I can't. Yeah, I mean, you look at the last, the you look at the last guy that was a teenager to make it to Portland, the Red Sox organization, you know, it's 2012 with Xander Bogarts and, you know, the next year, you know, he was in the majors by the end of that year. And so um, I think he has that type of potential just because of, you know, obviously, you know, you can look at the extra base hits and how hard he hits the ball and barrels the ball and stuff. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, he's just incredible, like, you know, plate discipline, you know, what he wants to do at the plate in terms of there's a 17.5 walk percentage. Uh, this past year in the minors and it's like you know how do, you don't see that from a 19 year old and so you know you look at like you know Abreu and, and Casas who are so good at you know chase rate you know chase percentage and stuff like that and he can be that type of guy that I mean he's gonna strike out sometimes he had some you know issues at Greenfield with strikeouts especially against left-handers but I think he's the type of guy that you know like he really has the potential to make that jump and you know, it could be out and, you know, like they may not need him next year either. Right. Like, you know, just, uh, you know, I mean, if he's, it, it, you know, it depends. I mean, he's just work, work his way up and, you know, he could, you know, force them into that kind of decision like Mookie Betts did, you know, and, but like, you know, I mean, you know, I just think he has that potential. I mean, if he climbed up three or four levels this year, why can't he climb up two next year? Yeah, the talent is definitely there, and just the fact that he improved at each level. And I mean, Salem is kind of a weird thing anyway, where he wasn't—he just wasn't swinging at things that he 
didn't think he could hit, but him going up from uh, high A to double A and still performing at double A. I mean, that was that was pretty encouraging. Small sample size, but I will. I thought it was it was. I was surprised that you said that out loud, but I was kind of, part of me was kind of like, oh, I feel I feel validated. Thank you. It's interesting. Respect. It's interesting. Like, you know, you look at the the competition too at Portland and, you know, I think the average, the age differential is like, you know, he's like three and a half years younger than, you know, most of the people there and stuff like that. I, oh, mean, yeah, I mean, the average age of the person in Portland now, you know, and we saw Marcelo, you know, struggle uh, at Portland. However, you know, you, you would hope that, a lot of that has to do more with, you know, the injury than the age thing, but the age thing is a factor too. I mean, like, you know, and so, you know, these are young guys. And so to, to have that kind of impressive run, obviously at the, you know, at the end of the year with Portland, you know, is, is kind of crazy. And then, you know, Kyle Teal. Now, obviously he was a college pick, but (laughs) he made a really fast ascent too. And I was looking at him and he was on my list just because like, you know, you look at it and obviously Craig Breslow is going to try to find a backup catcher, right? Like somebody with major league experience that can start in, you know, Pawtucket, uh, Pawtucket Worcester next year, you know, kind yeah, of like can't a, have a Jorge Alfaro situation. Alfaro again. But like, you know, the way that I've heard about Teal's defense and everything, I mean, the most important thing you want from a, what, a third catcher, a guy that can come up if McGuire or, Wong is injured is defense and you know he might be better than anybody that they could get defensively I mean that's the number one priority defense right like you know the hitting's on the back burner and so like those guys that made that fast you know that fast ascent um I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised either either one of them well let me let me ask you the three guys that you mentioned Mayer Anthony and Teal I'm not a betting man but if you had to bet which one do you think is going to get to the major leagues first? That's a good question. Um, I would say, <laughs> I would say Marcelo. Now, I think that, um, you know, Teal, I mean, catching, you know, it's, it's funny, like Boris, I don't think Boris takes like, you know, every guy, I mean, he knew the potential of this kid when he took him as a client, right? Right. Like, um, you know, uh, but you know, also the catching position is, is difficult because you have to, you know, it's more than just go, you know, more than goes into it. You have to be that leader and stuff like that at the pitching staff and all that. So they might want to have him develop for an entire year or whatever. I think that Marcelo's issues, I mean, if you look at what he told Bradford about when that injury happened, uh, that shoulder injury and everything, and then the week that he took off after that and the numbers, you know, dramatically went down. The first, you know, the first thing that I saw when, you know, I saw Marcelo in, in, you know, spring training his first year in the Red Sox organization was just like, wow, that, that's, that's sweet swing. You know, like there's just not like too much, you know, going on. It's just, just, you know, so smooth. And so I think that we will see him like next year or, you know, in 2024, get off to a good start at Portland. Right. Like, I, I don't think that, it's going to be the case where he goes back and does what, you know, struggles the way he did. I think he, he'll be healthy. He'll be, you know, a year older. Motivated. Motivated. Oh, motivated. Definitely. Um, and, you know, you look at it and, you know, they're obviously Breslow is going to try to get like, you know, sure up that second base ball. But there is, there is, you know, I mean, Trevor Story has had, you know, plenty of injuries. Now you look at, you know, uh, Trevor Story's, you know, game logs when he was in, in, in Colorado and he was very durable, but you know, he hasn't been obviously over the past two years. So, you know, you might need a shortstop because of that or something, or, you know, you might want to figure out the second base position. And if he's off to a hot start, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping, or I think that Craig Breslow will probably not go into spring training with just what they have on the 40 man roster in terms of second base wise, but you know, if you don't find somebody, you know, that's, there's an option there. It's either, to, you know, you move story. I'm not saying out of spring training, that's what it's going to be the opening day roster, but I'm saying if he gets off to a hot start in Portland and stuff, he, he works his name into that. So I'd say probably him, but you know, like, as I said, you know, they, 
they're the you know Kyle Teal might be better than what they get in terms of you know defensively in terms of what they get is a you know third emergency catcher if if uh, one of those two guys at the you know in the major leagues goes down and so then you know they they might like it so you know it could be it could be any of them but I would think that um, Marcelo probably. There's one other guy in this group, and then I will let I, I will stop hoarding this from you, Parker. But um, one good, other man. guy that uh, you didn't that that and we haven't mentioned him as much, but he is part. He was very young at Double A last year. Plays a mid infield position. Had a nice bounce back season. And that's Nick York, um, who you know he was the Portland uh, Portland Sea Dogs team MVP. Um, it wasn't the best season, but he stayed healthy. He hit reasonably well. Do you think that he plays a role in this in the in the future of the Red Sox, um, or is he more just fancy trade bait? Like I thought, he could have been trade bait like this, you know, past offseason. You've got repetitiveness at certain positions, and I you look at like a Blaze Jordan who is really hot, obviously at you know Greenville, and um, you know you have Tristan who you know is going to be your long term first baseman or whatever. So why like? You know, that was my issue with Bloom is he has repetitiveness at certain positions and yada, yada, yada. Um, York is, you know, as we talk about, second base is an open, you know, position here, uh, a, t- a spot that they don't have, you know, great depth at right now. And I look at his year, it's very, it's very challenging because like, you look at what he did his first year in the minor leagues you know, as what, like an 18, 19 year old coming out of high school that first year was ridiculous. Like the strikeout rate was like 14 point, you know, 14% or something like that. The walk rate was 11%. I mean, he was making great contact and he was slugging too. And so I don't know if there's been, I mean, obviously the injuries, his second year, you know, put in, didn't help. Yeah. Didn't help. But also maybe there's just a, you know, a change in approach too. He's trying to hit, he's selling out a little bit for more power. I don't know. I mean, I don't know, but like, I'd like to see him just become more of that, you know, hitter he was in the first year where he's just, you know, racking up the, you know, contact guy. Yeah. And, and so sort of like the, the second coming of Howie Kendrick at, yeah. at, 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 at uh, Salem initially. And he's, you know, he hasn't been bad, but he's definitely, he's not what he was that first year either. Yeah. And, you know, so um, you look at him, though, and, you know, he looks like he's a guy that is motivated in good shape and stuff like that. And, and, you know, and I just I think he has a lot of potential. But, you know, I think I got overhyped about him maybe the first year just because what he was doing. If you look down that, you know, the first round picks that, that year, I mean, he was it was pretty incredible what he was doing. He was outperforming a lot of guys that were picked ahead of him. So I got a two-parter for you, and you've kind of mentioned a little bit on the Breslow thing. Um, so my first question of this is, did you get tired of writing rumor articles about who was going to be the guy or declining and all that? I know you've kind of mentioned it. And then my second part of it is, which you alluded to earlier, is um, do you think he's going to be aggressive in moving some of these prospects, and how soon will do you think that will come? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would rather write about trade rumors and free agent rumors than, you know, GM rumors. I mean, this is kind of a weird, uh, you know, thing where Sam Kennedy came out and said, like, you know, he didn't think that, you know, only having the last three GMs or the head of baseball operations for four, you know, four years each and then getting canned each one of them uh, would, you know, affect people wanting to come. But if you look at it, I mean, you know, look at a guy that's well-respected has been in that position a long time. Does he want to uproot his family to, you know, Boston, um, you know, for the potential of, you know, only being there for four years and stuff, you're uprooting your family. You have to think about family stuff and all that. And, and, um, you know, I wish that actually, I wish the owners of the Red Sox would be the, the, um, would be the um, uh, the athletic director at Syracuse because I would really like the football coach out. <laughs> it's like they, they they have no patience, and I would love the no patience approach at Syracuse. But uh, no, but like you know, so um, you know, it's it's an interesting like it was it was interesting you know to hear some of the stuff, and you know, Catillo was really 
you know, good at getting some of those rumors. Obviously, Alex Spear was like those two were got like fighting over stuff like that. Like, you know, who could be first on that stuff? Bradford got a lot of good information too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that uh, what was the second part of the question? I know you said to get bored with. The- yeah, no, it's it's all good. Um, yeah, so my second part of that was you had kind of talked about earlier that like Bloom had a lot of repetitiveness at positions. Now, do you think that he will dip into the prospects this offseason? And do you, how fast do you think that will come? I think it's 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 interesting of like how he's going to, you know, I have no idea what his approach is. Like, I don't know what he's going to be. He's only been a number three, like, you know, and he has had in Chicago, he did have, you know, insight into or, you know, he was involved in, you know, free agent signings and things like that evaluating talent but i don't know like what he's going to be he could be extremely like you know a uh, bloom who doesn't want to trade you know anybody in terms of prospects because for fear that they're going to be the nef- next jeff bagwell or something like that um or he could be you know uh you know more of a guy like Theo Epstein where he, you know, he was, he was willing to trade guys, but he also wanted to develop, you know, from within and stuff like that. So it's hard to tell. Um, I think that the great thing about Breslow is, is that they do have some interesting pitchers in their organization. Um, They don't have much, obviously like, you know, depth guys that you can like plug into the rotation, right? A double A, triple A, right? Like, you know, somebody that's ready and stuff like that. And I think he, you know, there's been that narrative that Boston has had difficulty, um, you know, developing pitching. And I think that, you know, that's his expertise. And the, the most important thing, you know, is, is, is straightening that out and getting guys that are starting pitchers, getting guys that, you know, and, um, you know, like a Gonzalez and, and, you know, um, like, you know, he has the potential, but his walk rates up like that, you know, figure some things out. And it's funny. I was thinking the other day, I was like, Brian Abraham, who's the farm director, obviously was actually caught Breslow, right? Like, you know, is the 2013 bullpen catcher and everything. So they already have a, you know, relationship started. It's going to be like, he has to really just delve in. Actually, that was going to be a question I asked him at the GM meetings, like how much, studying do you do on the farm system like immediately when you get the job because obviously the most important thing is to know your own players right and to know you know who you can trade who who you want who can be a good player who maybe won't be that type of thing you know so like the self-evaluation is the most important thing and he hasn't been here so he's gonna have to you know lean on a lot of the guys like brian abraham and stuff to give him reports do you believe that the candidate for uh, for for whoever takes over as GM is already in the system, or do you think that they're going to outsource for that? I think they probably will outsource for it. If it's if it's an internal candidate, I think the best. You know, I I thought that Eddie Romero was you know good for the head the head yep. job, right? Like I think love, that love Eddie, Eddie love Eddie Romero. This is a pro Eddie Romero podcast. Yeah, like I think that you know. So if there's anybody, I think it will be him. Um, you know, you have seen guys, they have gone from within, you know, Dombrowski with Mike Hazen and, you know, and then, uh, Bloom with, uh, BOH and stuff like that. But like with, with Ramiro, I think that, you know, he's so interesting because like, I think he, I think he's a really good evaluator of talent. I think that he has the, (laughs) I don't want to say the balls, but you know, he's, he, to, to make a move and stuff like that, like to, to, you know, to go out there and, you know, trade a prospect and stuff. And so, you know, I think that he, you know, he's, he's just, um, and he's a good communicator, right? Like he just is a people person and, you know, that's so important. He relates so well, like talking to the players, the players really like him and stuff like that. And, and he's, I think he would be great for it, but, you know, maybe Breslow picks somebody from outside, but if they're, you know, the last two times they've done it from within, if anybody is that guy, I would say it should be Ramiro. I'm going to kind of uh, go a little um, like off the rails here. It's a little opposite of what we've been just talking about. And I'm assuming you've been tuning into the world series and not Tommy DeVito playing quarterback for the giants, but um, uh, they, I heard they didn't let him throw the ball, but that's all I know. 
Oh, it was bad, man. It was on red zone and they were just like, oh, DeVito's in. And he like threw like three passes. They went like negative five yards. He wouldn't throw it beyond the line of scrimmage. I, I don't know anything about football. So I'm just assuming this is Danny DeVito's son. <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's it's Syracuse Tommy, legend. Who's uh, yeah, he 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 was a quarterback for Syracuse uh, for four years or whatever. And then he kind of lost his job his final year and transferred to Illinois. But yes, he was a Syracuse quarterback. So. Well, I, I, so you obviously weren't watching that, which uh, Giants Jets, it was bad. But um, what have you thought so far of like the playoffs, the postseason? Were you expect, you know, what did you think about the Diamondbacks run and everything? Like, do you have any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, I didn't think that I was like, I'm in the um, Mad Dog Brousseau category of Diamondbacks. I had no, I thought that the Phillies were easily going to take that. Actually, Catillo was, I was talking to Catillo about like, um, you know, we were kind of like trying to like figure out like, you know, some angles and he was like, Oh, I'm going to write about, you know, what didn't happen with Nathan Avaldi, like, you know, well, how they, why they didn't sign him kind of get some, talk to some people. And I was like, do it on Schwarber too, just because, you know, people are asking that question, even though it's kind of easier to understand why they didn't, you know, bring back Schwarber. It's like, and I was like, because he's definitely making the world series. That's what I said to Catillo. And, I was completely wrong on that. Um, you know, pitching and defense, obviously, you know, win in the postseason, and um, that's an area that the Red Sox lacked, right? Especially defensively. I mean, obviously, pitching wise, but defense that that needs to improve, and we've seen that. I mean, I don't think there's been any errors in two games in the World Series so far. The Diamondbacks have played great defense uh, throughout, and um, you know, the the Houston Texas series was. It was awesome. I enjoyed that. I like, you know, uh, big name pitchers in games like that. Seeing Verlander and Scherzer, who Scherzer obviously going to pitch tonight and stuff like that. And and seeing Evaldi, that's that's the type of stuff I like, is I like to see a good pitching matchup. I was the type of kid when, you know, I was growing up in just outside of Boston, I would, you know, look at the Red Sox schedule and count every five days to get the Pedro Martinez tickets. I'd, I'd pick a you know, one nothing. Uh, you know, game over. Uh, you know, a, a fifteen to fourteen game any day. I love pitching, good pitching, and good pitching matchups. And and so, um, you know, that's it's been like that in the postseason. And um, you know, it's been an interesting postseason. Obviously, we've seen you know pitching and defense, but also home runs are so important and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I mean, it's been a good post. What do you, what have you guys uh have taken away from this, if anything? Oh, you know, just the, the World Series went exactly as everybody planned it to. Um, everybody predicted Texas Rangers, Arizona Diamondbacks, and that's what we got, you know. So the script writers, a little too obvious this year. Yes. That, that, that's yeah. my takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, for real, though, it's been, it's been fun. It's been really yes. fun, man. Like, how many times have the Diamondbacks been going back to back? We've gotten to see some, like true young talent tr guys that are going to be stars for a while. Corbin, uh, like uh, Corbin Carroll, um, yep. you know, uh, Evan Carter, um, G uh, Gabriel uh, Moreno, like just some really interesting players, some guys that have been good for a while, but we haven't really gotten to see them as much on the big stage, like Zach Gallon. Uh, that's mm -hmm. been, it's been really cool. Jordan, the rise of Jordan Montgomery and just mm -hmm. like uh, totally boosting up his value uh, in free agency. It's postseason's always fun, but this is, this has been a good year for it. And I think that, you know, like I knew Mike Hazen from his time with the Red Sox. And obviously it's a good story that, you know, his wife, you know, died of cancer 14 months ago or whatever. And, you know, it was a very challenging time and he took time off and obviously he's got, I think he's got four boys that they have four sons and, I remember seeing three of them when he got the GM job, you know, when Dombrowski named the GM at Fenway. I remember the three of the sons came and and his wife and, you know, how, how much, you know, joy they had that day just walking around the park. And, you know, this is cool that dad has this this type of job. And it's such a, a tragedy, you know, to like, you know, think that that happened to that family. And it's, you know, it, it is cool. Um I, you know, I, I was thinking the other day, I don't, I don't care who the Ranger, if the Rangers or the Diamondbacks win, but actually it would be a really cool story if the Diamondbacks won, you know, simply because of that, like, you know, and, and like how he's handled, you know, this situation and, and how this has helped him. And, um, you know, he's, uh, that's a brave family right there. 
Yeah, really, it's, really is. And that's an aspect of it that I feel like, um, I don't know, at least I, it's not something that I that I had given a lot of thought to until the story started to come out a little bit more. So there's I, been a lot yeah. of stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it really does make for a compelling narrative. Yeah. All right, I want to. Yeah. I want to jump into um unless you have another thought on that. No, 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 no. Jump in, jump. Okay. In. I was going to go into something different here and I uh so every single morning I pop onto our our favorite app Twitter/X. Slash um I'll see a Christopher Smith story that's like right there at like what 7 a.m. I think. Maybe 7 7:30, 7 whatever it is. And it's always like a, it's always a headline and it never has the player in it. And I know who the player is every time. And I still freaking click it every single time. But my question to you on that front though, is how do you get, so I guess like what I, what I wanted to ask is like, this has probably been the best farm system the Red Sox have had since you've been covering them professionally, I would assume. Um, so how do you get ideas for which prospect you're going to write about each and every day? Well, first of all, the, the no name in the headline is a big shift from what we did in, in the past. Whereas, um, and a lot of people think that that's clickbait like type thing. And it really is not. It's actually that, you know, first of all, I wrote about, you know, Caden Rose uh, the other day. It's like, well, how many people actually have ever heard of Caden Rose that are Red Sox fans? So if I even put his name in the headline, what is that going to do? And you're trying to narrow the head down headline now down to 75 characters. So it's, you know, it's tight and does best on Google. And that's what we've actually seen with trends is, is that, um, you know, where I would write exactly what the story was about in a, you know, a 130 character headline before with everybody's name in it. Um, we have found out that, you know, that Google actually does better now with smaller headlines and stuff like that. And so um, I can understand. So I actually try to put the headline. I, I try to, you know, write the player's name sometimes in Twitter and stuff because I know that that does tick people off. But, um, you know, I do things, you know, um, different ways like i went down to the the develop the fall development camp and you know a lot of times i'm just trying to like i read i like i try to like you know find as many things as possible on, online about them right like so um and that can be from going to their college page you know and seeing a player that they liked like a you know how like they have that personal page at the end of their college and stuff like that they're into this activity or something like that I often go to their Instagram uh, pages, their you know Twitter pages, all their social media, see if they posted anything interesting, like any interesting photos of them doing any in, anything interesting. And a lot of times, it's just going in there and just the conversation that you have with the player goes in a different direction that you didn't even know it was going to go into. Um, I think that you know I'm not the type of person, obviously, that writes about just the top ten, you know, prospects in the organization. I want to write about everybody, and and you know, like Abreu when they traded for him uh, for Houston. I mean, he wasn't you know the biggest top prospect. Um, I don't remember how that that um, story went when I went to Portland, but we ended up talking about you know how he owns his own barber shop in the in Venezuela and stuff. So. It's actually interesting. Cotillo has actually asked me to talk to his Boston College class before about like how <laughs> how I get such odd uh, topics or get like people to say things, and I don't. It just kind of goes in in the direction. I don't know. Like I just kind of have a conversation with them, and I think that's good when you talk to Red Sox players in general, right? Like you know, and building relationships. Like Mitch Moore, I have no idea about anything about hunting, but like. I would talk to Mitch Moreland about hunting and stuff like that because that's what he liked. That's what he likes to do. It's and um, so you try to find what these players like, and then they'll open up to you more. Um, so, you know, I mean, I I just look like you know if, if a guy's having a good run, you know, a good two month run or something, it's like, well, let's write about him. Um, he doesn't have to be the top prospect. 
Uh, he doesn't have to be, you know, the guy that everybody knows about. Um, I thought you know, that a guy that you did a really good job on that with recently was Christian Campbell. I thought that was that was such an excellent profile that you did of him. And it was, you know, because with Teal moving up so quickly, like everybody knew about that. But Campbell got drafted this year and he was already at a high A. He got brought up very quickly as well. And that was a guy that I think was really sliding under the radar. So, again, props props to you on that one. Yeah, I mean, I I knew that he was I, like, you know, he was actually I listed him in some article that you know to to watch out for him because you know his his stats that he had produced you know in that short span or whatever. And then I got the opportunity to talk to him and it's just kind of just chatting with him and you know he told me about how like it was crazy like you know like D D Gordon like you know he was just like went to games in Chattanooga and you know when he was in Double A and you know he just. D Gordon just kept seeing his face show up and show up again. And he actually ended up having this really good relationship with D Gordon that he still has to this day. He texts him D Gordon, like he went to D Gordon's games when D Gordon was in Miami and stuff like that. And so, um, but I think the, the way that I got him that, I, that I asked him that was just uh, basically like, how did you get into it? Because he was telling, I, I had read on his, uh, page at Georgia Tech that his father was a Tennessee football player. And so I said to him, I go, why didn't you play football? You know, and stuff like that. Like, who got you into the baseball? And he's, he's like, my father actually uh, discouraged me from f- playing football because of all he went through, you know, the 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 hard, you know, football and everything. And and then he's like, so I was like, oh, but did your, your father is a big baseball guy? Did he play baseball? Didn't? No, actually, he never played baseball. I was like, well, how did you get into baseball then? And he's like, well, you know, the, the ballpark, the, the double-A ballpark was right down the street. So that's just kind of how that happened. But, yeah, uh, I try to get kind of everybody. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I look at it and I'm like, oh, I wrote a really good feature on that guy a couple of years ago, and he's already, he's already he's been released. And, you know, like, but, you know, if, if a person has a story to tell, you know, it should be heard. Yeah, definitely. There's so many of those within the minors that we don't really get to hear that much about. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it, there's, there's always a lot to, to choose from there. Um, I do have a question for you. That's moving a little further away from, uh, from the minors though. And that's um, back to the Red Sox regarding their outfield situation. They have a plethora of guys that are all kind of left-handed hitting and similar skill sets. You know, we've got Yoshida, Verdugo, Duran, Abreu, <laughs> St. on Rafaela, and Rob Ref Snyder was extended for a year or two. Now, Ref Snyder was right handed, so there's a bit more of it's a little different for him. Uh, so is Rafaela, but you just it just doesn't make a lot of sense to keep that many guys. They're all on the 40 man. You can't keep all those guys on the 26 man. What do you think happens with the outfield situation? Um, who do you think is most likely to get traded? And if there's anybody that gets signed, like a right-handed power bat, who do you think it's going to be? I think that the most likely person to get traded is Alex Verdugo. Um, yeah. You know, he's going into his walk here. He does have some value. Obviously he's a guy that, you know, he has a lot of potential offensively that, you know, he just has these slumps that he goes into, but you know, the, the, the potential has always been there. He's, you know, he's the finalist for a gold glove in right field. He had a really good year defensively in right field. And I think maybe a change of scenery would be good for him. I think there's people, there's mixed opinions in the Red Sox organization on, on Alex Verdugo. I mean, like, you know, he, he is, you know, he, he was late and he, you know, he got, you know, um, uh, bench for that. He got benched for, uh, for not hustling when, you know, you could look at other players on the team and they didn't hustle either. So, you know, but, uh, you know, so like, I think that there's, there's mixed feelings on him with people in the organization. Uh, obviously I don't know what Breslau thinks about him. Right. But, um, I think he's probably the most, uh, likely to get, uh, traded. Uh, what do you think they could get for him? Well, since he's going into a walk year, I don't think it's going to be as much as they could have got for him last offseason, mm-hmm. right? Like, but I think they need to trade some of these, you know, 
I, I would try to look for, you know, young controllable players, obviously. I just, I have no idea. I actually haven't asked any executives what, they, that's actually a good story right there. What can you get for Alex Verdugo with one year left on his contract? Um, because you, you, you would want like, you know, maybe package him with some prospects and maybe get a starting pitcher. Right. But I don't know. I don't know if that, you know, if you put the right prospects into place with that, then you will. Um, so, you know, it could just depend on who they package him with. Um, so yeah, so I think that, you know, he's, he's probably the most, uh, tradable. I wouldn't say that, you know, Duran's totally off, you know, like, uh, untouchable. I would think that they would look at, you know, a market for him. I like Duran a lot as a player. I mean, like, you know, the amount of, like, he, 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 he played like, what was it, like two 200 less plate of, fewer plate appearances than, you know, Verdugo and he was second on the team and like by just a couple on doubles. Like the, the, the amount of times I saw this guy like actually take a single and move it, uh, extend it into a double this year is crazy. And uh, I think he has a lot of talent. I think his speed's a factor and all that. But, you know, you may look to, to move him. Um, you know, so those are two guys that I, I would think. And, Yoshida's just, you know, it's difficult with that situation because he's not a great defender, obviously, in left field. And, and uh, you know, you look like, well, could he be the long-term DH? But he doesn't give you DH-type production either, right? Like, they, you know, he's not a guy that's going to hit a ton of home runs and, and slug and stuff like that. He's a different type of hitter than what a DH would be. So they have a lot of, like, Breslow has a lot of, like, questions to answer in terms of the outfield like how do you improve the outfield defense how do you you know like uh, it, there's just a lot of a lot of questions there that he needs to to answer and so yeah it's going to be interesting um i really i know that the the free agent market is kind of a bad one coming up right it's, uh, that that's that's um a kind way of putting it it <laughs> is after there is, there is such a drop off after the first 10 to everybody else it's, yeah it's kind of nuts um you are not this is not a year to re to rebuild through free agency. You can get a couple of starting pitchers in there. Um, like they're not that bad for it, but they're still mostly, you know, like number threes ideally. Yeah. And then there's not I mean, Tasker Hernandez and Lourdes Gurriel are probably your best two outfielders. Um, and he's and Gurriel's like, you know, he had a really good year defensively. I mean, yeah. Had, oh, and he, he hit too. He, 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 yeah. I mean, so if they could get him. Uh, you know, and, and moves and trade some guys that would be like, I actually put him as, you know, I, I put together a list of free agents in the ALDS and AL, ALDS and NLCS or N a ALCS and NLCS. Whatever playoff matchup. <laughs> Whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he was like the 10th guy on the list. I was like, I don't think it's going to happen, but if you're looking for, you know, to, to kind of, you know, do some things uh, in the outfield. He'd be a, I think he'd be a perfect fit. I have some, uh, some random questions here that uh, how many, how many MLB ballparks have you been to so far? I've been to every one except for um, Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I was going to make the trip to Pittsburgh uh, last year, not this past year, but the year before. And it just got messed up. But um, yes, I only have one ballpark remaining and i have covered a game at every ballpark except for pittsburgh and uh san francisco at&t but i have been to at&t i went out there i made a special point to go out there when i was covering the red sox against oakland and uh actually at the first time i did cover the wrigley series right after the all-star break with the red sox there so i did cover three red sox games but the first time i ever actually went to wrigley was when the Red Sox were in Chicago to play the White Sox a few years before that. I had, you know, and I made it a point to go over and see Wrigley Field. Uh, so yeah, so it's been a, it's been a um, the first actual ballpark that I actually covered a game in that wasn't that wasn't Fenway Park was um, was Oakland the, the Oakland Coliseum or whatever they call that place. And so that was actually yeah, my it's... first trip was Oakland Oakland and uh, Seattle. And so I went from one, you know, I was like, wow, this place. Is... And, you know, to Seattle, which is great. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Seattle, but that's just awesome park. 
I wanted yeah. to ask though, what was what was your the best opposing ballpark to go to, and what was the worst? Well, I think that like you know, in terms of like you know, just looking at the ballpark and, you know, I, I like to go and walk around every ballpark when I go, um, you know, I actually, I try to, you know, you, you get in so early before games. And so I try to like go to the top of the stadium, you know, when I'm, when no one else is in there and, you know, walk around and, and walk to every little aspect of the stadium. And I always thought like Coffin stadium, Royals Coffin stadium is just a really cool stadium. Um, there's the, the waterfall's cool, but they've got so much there. Um, I really like that ballpark. I think it's just a good looking ballpark. Um, Toronto, uh, is obviously a great place when Toronto Blue Jays are, are playing well. I mean, that place can get absurdly loud. I remember covering a game in there where, uh, where, uh, Josh Donaldson hit a grand slam off clay buckles and I could like, it was the loudest I've heard. It was like a, it was like a, you know, a pass and actually made the example of like Philadelphia being like an SEC, uh, you know, place this year in the postseason. It was like that in Toronto. I mean, that place gets crazy when they're good. And I wish I had been there. I think that was the same year Batista hit the the home run in the you know the postseason, which that place went crazy. But um, so those are probably the two, which from a work standpoint, actually like, you know, the, the Tropicana field is actually a good park. And like, <laughs> just because the press box is really big and, and it's right near the, like right down low. And so you can see everything really good. And, and, uh, Camden Yards is another one. Some of those ballparks like Camden Yards, you have to really watch out for foul balls. Like you have to really be paying attention every, every, every minute of the game or you're going to, you know. Because there was actually two that came flying right near me this year at Kingdom Yard. So yeah, it's been it's really cool to get to go to ballparks and you know to see different things. I, I wanted to follow that up with um, th this is a food podcast. We talk about food all the freaking time. Um, every single Red Sox prospect we have on here, we always ask him a question. I'm not going to ask you that question just because you're a Northeastern guy. We can still um, ask him. And... I, I don't see why we can't ask him that. They have that food that we're talking about in the Northeast. It's not the right food, though. That's, he, there's, he's not going to. He's All right, fine. I'll ask it to you. What is your go-to fast food fried chicken place? I don't have a <laughs> KFC. I <laughs> I haven't been there since college, though. Um, I actually have uh, <laughs> to, to pat myself on the back here. My my daughter has uh, um, a milk and egg allergy, and so she she's four years old, so she can't eat like you know pizza unless it's vegan pizza and all this stuff and everything. So the last outbreak that she had, she did like this uh, egg challenge with the. Um, with the actual allergist and ended up at the hospital because of her reaction being so bad. I told her now from now on, I'm only going to eat what you ate. So I don't, I don't wow. eat anything that she can't eat except when I'm on the road. If it's a ballpark where there's no other food and I can't, I, I have no options if I'm, if she's not with me in another ballpark. So that's, that's the only time I can do it. But otherwise, uh, I only eat, I don't eat milk, egg, dairy, that type of stuff anymore. That is a devoted father right there. I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, well, I feel bad for, you know, like I, I, it was after the second hospital visit that I was mm. like, you know, this really sucks for her. You, we always have to bring her food to like parties, stuff like that. Like we, you know, birthday parties, kids, birthday parties, they had yeah. pizza the other day. And we had to, you know, so if I'm eating the pizza at the kid's birthday party, you know, like I can, I can not eat that pizza. Right. Like, you know, so like, you know, so I try to do that for her. So not very good with food. No, it's respectable. I, I had, I had to ask, but I, I kind of figured, you know, us, which, even... what are you talking about though, in terms of the ch fry, uh, fried chicken it's it's like so the right the correct answer is zaxby's it's a southern chain then you have canes and then people have said chick-fil-a people have said oh, yeah, yeah. people meeting the majority have said chick-fil-a <laughs> no, i think i think canes may have the majority to be honest no, i like i like chick-fil-a yeah like it's good it's all good i'm not i'm not hating just zaxby's <laughs> is the right answer um i so think it's our end is, game is to get zaxby's sponsorship for this show <laughs> I've already put it in my Twitter bio. So, um, by the way, the guy we had on in the last episode, he, I thought he was joking. 
Um, and then also Brennan Salucci at Tulane, his teammate is like somebody higher up at, at when they were playing in Tulane was like the co-owner of Canes. So they were like, we had it all the time. So it was crazy. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So the fried chicken thing, not a really thing up in the Northeast. I get it. Um, well, I hear one, that there's some pitching pitchers on the 2011 Red Sox that were big in the fried chicken. <laughs> just, yeah, just, kind of into, <laughs> we should just rebrand the show, the, the chicken and beer boys, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind about that. Okay, oh, go man. on. Sorry. <laughs> no, Ed, Ed, what do you got? Um, all right. So I, I made a tweet about this a while back and, and it was dead serious about <laughs> it. Um, my dad has gone on the record saying that not only are you, Christopher Smith, his favorite Red Sox writer, you're also the only one that he likes. Um <laughs> Which, Which is funny because other than Peter, people, he liked Peter Gavin's a lot, but nobody has accepted the man. How, how does somebody not like Chad that? Jennings, man? I don't I know. know. I don't think he, really, I don't think he has like a subscription to the athletic. Chad nicer than me. Actually, I'm very person that's like hard to get to like it for. But you have to kind of know my personality a little bit. So I don't know why that is. Although me and Catillo, we really mesh together real quick and stuff. Well, he like loves that. your writing. He 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 thinks that you are the best Boston writer since Peter Gavin. So, thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, father but my question for you though is yeah. who is your favorite baseball writer um that's a good question uh you know i i liked how you know like jeff passing like you know the way that he approaches things like even bef before he got the job at espn like i always liked how he was breaking news in terms of like major topics, right? Like, you know, instead of just like this guy is, you know, and obviously he's, you know, he has to do that now where he's, you know, breaking for agent, you know, news about, you know, this guy dropping bombs atomically. There was a lot of like really good things though, that he would write like, you know, for Yahoo and even for ESPN still now that, you know, just the things that, he's able to find like investigative type stuff. And I really like that type of, of journalism is investigative. Um, you know, I mean, you can look at breaking news and I can have, you know, this prospects, you know, being promoted or this players being promoted from Worcester to uh, Worcester to Boston, you know, to, uh, for, to, you know, according to source, but like, you know, after I do that, two seconds after I do that, 10 people will have it, right? So like, the cool thing is when you really nail down a story, like, you know, about something and, you know, obviously with Drellick and Rosenthal, you know, doing that thing with the, the Houston Astros. I mean, that's like that type of thing that I'd really like to read. Uh, I'm into that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, I've read, I've read Peter Gammons plenty when, um, you know, I was growing up. Um, but I've always been the type of person that I like the, you know, it's important to incorporate analytics and, you know, in, in things like that into it. But I also like the kind of like the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the personal sides of things and stuff like that. I think that a good mixture of that in an article where you can get some of the, you know, um, learn somewhat about the person's personality, but also learn somewhat about what they are as a player, you know, especially with the, the prospect types is, or new guys that come to the Red Sox that maybe, you know, are on the major league roster that people don't know much about. I think that's, that's important is to, you know, to kind of blend those two things together. And so um, you've given us 50 minutes of your time right now. I just have, oh, I have one more. I'm, I can go for another 50. <laughs> I didn't know if you had to put children to bed or anything no, like that. So, oh, um, you guys saved me from that tonight. <laughs> wife is doing it. Okay, <laughs> I don't feel as bad then. I don't feel as bad. Um, I don't get married till next year, and Ed's getting married in a couple weeks, so we're not in that boat oh, yet. I know we will be one there day. soon. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. We'll be there soon, Ed. Don't worry. Kids are fun, um, but they're they're hard, man. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm excited. I'm not saying I'm not excited, but it's yeah. just like I'm I'm enjoying the it's quiet oh, yeah. like out there. She's watching a show. Like I'm like, oh. okay, I'm good. Well, um, me and my wife were married for quite a few years before we had kids. So um it was a real adjustment. <laughs> I thought we had a kid. And our, our youngest woke us up at, you know, like the first year, like four and and that was when she was ready to go for the day, you know, it was like four o'clock. I mean, I was in like the naps that she took during the day were like 20 minute naps total. Like so, like, you know, 20 minutes at a time total. So it's 
Yeah, the the one that we the, the our son who's one, he's actually um much better napper. He can nap for like two and a half hours straight, and I. But you know, it it it's a challenge. It definitely, I would say that have some fun with your with your wife before you have kids. <laughs> Go yeah. travel, do things. My wife actually used to come on a lot of these road trips with me. Like she's a teacher, as I said. So like, you know, during the summer, she um. You know, she would come to the West Coast. She, she's been, a, she's even been, in, you know, Kansas City. I mean, she would come to all these ballparks. Actually, Ian Brown was making a, a joke one time. He was like, "Your wife's been to probably more ballparks than you know half the the beat reporters." So, like, yeah, it's kind of cool. Like, travel as much as you can and do as many fun things as you can before uh, the kids, uh, <laughs> the kids give you hand, mouth, and foot disease. Yeah. Oh, I definitely, I, I remember seeing that story that you put out there. That's, uh, I've had it twice from them, but not making me excited for kids, <laughs> but we'll, we'll still get there. Um, I wanted to ask what is, what's, what's next for you this off season. So, um, you mentioned you're going to go to the GM meetings. I, I would assume you're going back to spring training, but what else do you got, um, scheduled this off season? Yeah. So I'm doing the GM meetings, uh, with Sean McAdam, who obviously Sean, you know, joined us at Mass Live during the season. And then the winter meetings will be Catillo and Sean. I love the GM meetings because and it's awesome that it's going to be in Arizona because I've already put in, you know, for credentials for three Arizona Fall League games. I'm really looking, um, you know, forward to seeing some of those players that are on the Red Sox play for Glendale uh, interviewing all those guys and, um, you know, coming home with a bunch of, you know, prospect stories as well. But the, the coolest part of the GM meetings is, and Bradford was actually the one that told me when I was, you know, when I was like 2010 or 11, when I was, you know, working in another place and, you know, kind of like paying my own way to certain things, like just to get ahead in the job. And he's like, if you want to go to uh, something that's valuable, go to the GM meetings, not the winter meetings, because they, and, and he was right, like the GM meetings, they set up a room with the GMs, you know, for an hour, the American League GMs, then for the next hour, the National League GMs, and you just can do one-on-ones and you can talk to them as about as much stuff as you want. And so it's a great experience. Um, you know, obviously the rumor mill isn't, uh, you know, pumping like it is at the winter meetings and transaction stuff like that. But I love the GM meetings because, you know, you can come away with some, you know, interesting stories after, uh, interesting stories away from it. So I'm going to enjoy that. I'm going to try to take some time off and spend with the kids and stuff. And, and, um, you know, it's really going to be kind of, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be cool with Breslau just to talk about some minor leaguers, right? Like, and ha- how his assessment is of the, um, of the system and stuff like that. I want to kind of know how he goes about that, right? Like how, what he's done, like, is he already watched, you know, so much, you know, tape and stuff like that and, you know, crunching the numbers on these guys. So I'm going to be big into that. Um, and so, yeah, so I, you know, the, the off season is always a fun time, you know, in terms of, because, you know, that it's much more fun in baseball than other, any other sport, right. The winter, the hot stove and stuff like that. So. Ed, I don't know if you, uh, if you have something else. Oh, I'm, I, you know, I've beaten, really happy with uh with everything tonight like thank you so much for uh for for giving us the, this time and this conversation and answering all of our questions do you do you want i'll give you one more story if you have time okay let's hear we it. have let's plenty hear it. of time i just don't want to keep you on forever you know but. yeah i want to hear it well the as i said i didn't i covered high school sports when i was you know the, right out of college i went to syracuse and i covered high school sports in missouri for a couple of years and uh, randomly came home, um, was like, you know, I miss my family or whatever, and I didn't have a job. And, um, you know, I quit that job after two years there, and I just came home, and I was like, I'm a drummer, so I was thinking, like, you know, like, get on the drums eight hours a day, maybe start a band, too, yada, yada, yada. And I just saw this job with the Eagle Tribune at that at the time, and, you know, it was kind of like a general assignment sports report, you'll do everything. So when I went there... Uh, you know, I, I grew up a, you know, huge baseball guy. I mean, as I said, I used to count Pedro's days, uh, you know, to go to his starts. Which I suburb went, are you from for Boston? Uh, I, I lived in Weymouth. Okay. So it's right. It's right near Quincy. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. And you know, when I, I actually, when I was, I, when I was growing up, I went to 
you know, Berkeley College of Music, like summer programs and stuff. And I'd end up walking over to Fenway, right, Park, Fenway. you know, like just to see the ballpark, just because yeah. I love, you know, baseball so much. And so, um, but the first, the first time I, so when I got that job, I wasn't like the Red Sox writer or whatever, but they needed somebody to go to some Red Sox games the first year. So, uh, they were like, anybody want to volunteer? And I was like, well, I've always liked baseball, so I can do it. You know, why not try? And so, um, I so I don't know if you know Bill Burke, but he's the sports editor at the Eagle Tribune. And he was supposed to go in with me to the first game. The first game was, uh, was Josh Beckett against uh, CC Sabathia on uh, Easter Sunday in 2010, Sunday night baseball game. And he was supposed to go in there and show me around and like help me out. On the way to like Easter brunch with uh, my family, I got so sick. I threw up several times in the car. I was stuck in the middle of the traffic on, oh, on no. the And I, <laughs> I threw up in the car. Uh, and I got home, I got to my parents' house and I said, I am wicked sick. I was like, I got to go up and, and sleep this off. And, and, uh, I get a phone message. Uh, I woke up to throw up probably. And I got a phone <laughs> message and it was Bill. And he's like, I, I heard, I'm sick. I can't come to the game tonight. So you're going to have to do it all by yourself. So I'm like, Oh no. Oh, I no. <laughs> so, um, what a coincidence, Bill. Yes, yeah. I but I didn't say anything. I was like, oh, I guess I'm gonna just do this. And my I was so sick, my father had to drive me in. I couldn't even drive. And so um that's like and, the most millennial work ethic story I think I've ever heard. Like, no, no, like oh I'm no, I'm I'm dying. It's fine. Let me go yeah, in. Let exactly. me go in. It's okay. Right. Yeah. But so uh so I went in there and I just had such a miserable time. I mean, I didn't throw up at all in there, but I was not feeling well and I had such a miserable time and, you know, it, it was up so late and just everything was difficult. It seemed. And I said to the sports editor after that, I'm like, you know, if you need me to go to a Red Sox game here and there, that's fine. But I, I like the high school sports. I, you know, I'm good, right, I'm good right. with, with the Red Sox. I don't, I don't really need to do this. And he said, well, why don't you go back one more time? Uh, Carlos Pena is going to be in town with the Rays and he's from Haverhill and we like Haverhill's this finest. He's like, you know, we get, we, we get a story with him every time. And, and, uh, and so I went back in that one time and um, I was like, all right, I'll try that one more time. I'll try one more time. So I went in back there and just kind of fell in love with it that one day, you know, so <laughs> like, you know, like just getting to talk one-on-one -on -one with, you know, Carlos Pena and being in the, you know, visitors clubhouse and seeing how much access that you actually had in there and stuff like that. And, and how much access you actually had in the home clubhouse. Eventually, I just didn't know that because, you know, there was a million reporters there on opening day and, you know, there's, but, uh, you know, so it was fun. Like, you know, when I was at the Eagle Tribune, um, I would, you know, I would, cover high school games and then, you know, write the story in the car and then head over to Fenway. Like I was doing a lot of that on my own time. And I uh, teach you how to write quickly too. <laughs> it does. And so I was really doing that a lot on my own time was just like, you know, and, and I even was late to my uh, rehearsal dinner because uh, for, for my marriage, because, you know, I was at, I was at Fenway getting some pregame stuff. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so like, in the dog house, well, so you know, actually she, that's why I always say like this good wife for me, cause she didn't really care. And so <laughs> I was like, she, she knows who I am. And you know, I was, I was on time for the wedding, the actual wedding. So that's, that's important. But, uh, well, can, can, I, yeah, can I ask yeah. about your experience working at Fenway? So I do data streaming for the, um, for the Woo Sox, which is like, I'm on the phone with an operator during it and I give them updates and they update gambling odds. They update the live scoring trackers, all that stuff. And I had the opportunity to do that um, for the Red Sox. Cause they're, they're always looking for people for that. It's kind of a thankless job, um, but you get like the press pass and you get to go into them for free. And I started taking it and I kind of had this like probably overthinking moment where I was kind of like, I don't want to lose the, magic of Fenway I don't want to lose that feeling that I get when I go there for however many games that I go to what that I've been doing since I was like a little kid um do you find that you no longer get that feeling 
or is it just that you can you have to like really compartmentalize because i imagine that when you're there every day and it's a job like it's it's got to be different it is different yeah definitely i mean i remember as a kid like the when i would go up um you know my my father would obviously bring me there when i was you know six or seven just walking up the ramp and seeing the green monster and just nothing like it it was nothing like it and like you know so um you know so it is um but it's cool to know like you know that you're in the ballpark that you know i mean i was a guy that watched 162 games as a kid like you know we'd go to um we'd go to some family party and I'd find my way out with my dad's keys into the car and listen to it on the game on the radio and stuff like that. So like, it's cool to have a job that, you know, I I grew up, like I appreciate it because of that, you know, like I, you know, and um, because, you know, I mean, I was a Tony Pena fan, you know, like, (laughs) like that was my favorite player you know, when I was six years old and he, you know, I followed him to the Cle- to the Cleveland guardians. We'll call, say the guardians, okay. um, you know, so uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, they spent so much fun, so many fun days at Fenway and it's like, it's still cool to go there, uh, but it is, you know, it, it doesn't have the same feel, I guess, as, as it once did, but it is, I appreciate every day I get to go there. Yeah, is um, I I kind of found myself. Uh, I spent every single, pretty much home game in Worcester this past year. I I just and... assumed they'd set up a cot for you there or something. I don't know how you managed yeah. to be there because you have you have a day job too. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I was I was tired once the end of the season was here, and it's not even I don't know. But I was uh, I found myself in in my fiance can probably attest to this is like I'm I wasn't as like oh well like I'm upset or whatever that they lost. It's like I just was like I wanted to go talk to you know whoever that had like a good game. I don't know. Um, definitely puts things into a different lens. I think, and I I think I can agree with you Ed, on that on for Fenway for me as well. Um, but Chris, we, uh, we, we appreciate the time. Uh, we could probably still chat for another like 50 minutes, but, um, <laughs> definitely, uh, appreciate the time. And, uh, we'd love to have you on sometime in the future. Yeah, as well, anytime, so. anytime you want me on, uh, I'm good. I'm good to go. Yeah, we'll have to have All that right. next 50 minutes right after a bunch of moves have been made. So <laughs> exactly. Emergency well, thank you. podcast after they sign, um, Shohei Otani. How about that? Oh, oh wow. okay. Otani emergency, Otani emergency podcast. I promise you, uh, I'll come on the emergency podcast with you if they sign Otani. I'll bring Cotillo on. That. I'll bring Cotillo on there with me. Let's go. I just wrote Let's it go. down, so it's official. But uh, <laughs> thank you, Chris. We appreciate All right. it. All right, guys. Have a